Welcome to Relogia, where all disciplines connect via art, sci, tech, trilogues. Four, co-creative environment, art, sci, tech, trilogue. Eight, on the art chair. Dr. Claudia Schnug, researcher, curator, art science consultant, author, Austria. Thank you. Oh, I don't see anyone. <laughs> so uh, it's a pleasure being here and um, it's a pleasure uh, to talk about my work after so many different presentations that actually perfectly feed into what I do and explain what I'm talking about in much more depth. So uh, I'm talking about uh, how to create uh, co-creative environments for art science or outside tech collaborations and why do we actually need this? So uh, before I talk about the collaborations, I shortly uh, talk a little bit about my background. So my background is actually very diverse. <laughs> so I started to study social and economic sciences and I got very interested in uh, collaborative work processes and what does it actually do with us when we collaborate with others, uh, somebody from very different dis disciplines. And what does it do with us when we uh, encounter art. So there was my second big love, the arts. So I also studied art theory and uh, media art and, and, and philosophy of art to get more knowledge about what it actually is, what we, we are talking about and what we are encountering. And then there, there's the science, it's always fascinating me. And um, I was lucky enough to get the chance. And here I'm also lucky that somebody else already presented work. Um, uh, Ryoji Ikeda's uh, Supersymmetry at CERN, that I had the possibility to really engage with these projects, with these programs where artists like uh, Ryoji Ikeda are able to collaborate with scientists like the particle physicists at CERN. So I started to develop um, these, uh, these programs and these projects where artists and scientists can collaborate, but in a way that it's not only about the creativity and innovation we hear as a goal, as an output, but really as something that feeds into the, into the process of their personal development and of their learning in order to make them more creative in what they actually do in science or in art. And also linking this to the organizations and why it's actually organizations uh, why it's actually interesting for them. So when you read blogs about uh, art science collaborations and these artworks, there's a lot of questions about why do we need an artist at CERN? Why do we need an artist uh, at these particle uh, physicist laboratories? Is it really something new that's coming out of there? So I was very interested about what's actually behind that and why it's important to put our effort, money, and focus on that. Uh, so I, was, um, I started to investigate this from very different angles. So here you can see quite a few of the questions that haunted me during the last uh, over 10 years actually now. Um, what do we want of the encounter with art in any other discipline? So the first question was, what does the encounter with art and aesthetics actually do? So what, what happens with us? And, and why should we encounter art and aesthetics? The second question was about the collaboration process. So what does it do with us getting engaged with uh, art science collaborations, with this interdisciplinary meeting between people of such diverse backgrounds, with so diverse craft skills and so diverse perspectives on how they approach topics in the world. And the last one is, how does it then affect our personal development, our organizational development, but also the processes that we have afterwards, that we use in our further work, 
uh, how does it create potential? And then actually, the last bit is just the outcome. So where does this outcome lead and what's the potential there? Um, so this is actually the big part of the research. And then actually there's the more practical question about what are the programs and processes that are actually possible and how do we integrate this in uh, organizations and, and, and other scientific uh, projects. So I'll really guide you very shortly through the first three questions and then introduce a few programs just as examples what you can do, what's interesting and what can be really beneficial for artists, scientists and organizations and thus actually also other stakeholders like society and cultural development or tech development. So. Um, I start with the first question, and very shortly, I'm, I'm really happy that I can build on so many different uh, other uh, talks, previous talks that actually ask these questions in depth. So the first one uh, that we see here with the regenerative reliquary, it's just a very pure example of a completely new aesthetic. So I, I like to use this as an example where uh, you get as uh, somebody not used to media art, not used to buy art, somebody uh, from a completely different field, you encounter something that's strange, that's new static, uh, but also something that's connected to scientific research and also uh, industrial and societal goals. So this here is about um, 3D printed uh, biomaterial that also uh, reflects on can we grow actually body parts to help uh, a medical development or to help people with certain diseases? So encountering art and, and these new art projects as scientists, but also as other organizations or, or stakeholders brings us in contact with completely new aesthetics, but also with cultural and societal questions. Uh, the next one is uh, embodied knowledge and aesthetics in the sense of not only what we see and hear is new to us, but also how we encounter our senses, how we um, are connected to the embodied knowledge we have. We heard uh, in Svetana's talk, for example, that there's this huge amount of task knowledge we cannot or we barely talk about. But encountering arts, encountering um, new aesthetic experiences, but also being forced to do something new, um, gets us more in contact also with this embodied knowledge. So uh, I like this uh, example of Modern Times by Charlie Chaplin, where he's trying to figure out what actually the industrial uh, processes of these workers in this firm are. So, but on the other hand, there are these workers, uh, if you know the film, in, in, in this industrial uh, organization that are so uh, surprised that there's somebody coming in playing just with what they use as work. But actually it does something with them, with their understanding of their craft, but also with the other one who comes in who has to learn this craft. And the last and the third one I want to mention that I think is extremely important and what we often in this very outcome-focused world, we do forget is fun and motivation. So encountering art, and there's nothing, nothing wrong about saying that I have to enjoy my work or that I have to enjoy moments, uh, I can enjoy art. Uh, and bringing art into other um, into other uh, environments can help just to release tension, just to uh, create motivation, or just to have people that are, uh, yeah, that have fun and, and thus are motivated later. So I think this is a very important part. Um, but then the next step I was researching was really getting even more into this. And as you can see, as I mentioned this, or as I explained the other projects, uh, it's very fluid. So what does encounter art do is also somehow influencing how we uh, experience art science collaboration. But here there's some other topics I want to talk about. For example, the first project 
uh, the Creatura Microconnectima is about uh, a collaboration process where neuroscientists and artists collaborated and they need to learn to talk to each other. And this is something we also heard quite often um, that we are talking expert to expert, we are talking uh, a lot to people where we think they should know something. But it's, it's, it's not that way that uh, collaboration works, it's not that way that we can actually talk about our work to non-experts. And just experiencing these collaborations helps us to find a new language and also a common ground. But we can do this also uh, with stakeholders. The next project is actually what uh, Anna Dumitriou is, I think, very good at in her projects, like uh, the Make Do and Man project, where she's talking, uh, where she's also including in this process, in this collaboration process, uh, public engagement opportunities and a lot of um, very um, simplified. Uh, um, communication uh, about very specific science that's going on. In this case, actually, it is uh, CRISPR-Cas that we, we heard about uh, in Ingeborg Reichel's talk, for example. <clears throat> so I think this is something that it's, it's going from, from how we talk to each other, how we talk, talk within projects between disciplines, but also how we include stakeholders. <clears throat> Uh, the next project is uh, also something that I found very interesting uh, that happens a lot, is that artists, as they have a completely different research process or approach to, uh, to questions and to complex topics, uh, it's, it's happening that they are able to contextualize or help scientists to contextualize their work in, different, uh, in a new way. So, here the example was that the artist contextualized the, the bio uh, laboratory in Basel's work with historical work that happened in Basel, but also with uh, the historical pharmaceutical uh, museum and generated a lot of outreach. And the last point, it's something very obvious, uh, it, but I think that's something we have to mention too, is about social networks. So when we um, when we are encountering somebody from a different discipline and somebody and we're working with them, uh, they also have a network. And, uh, and here again, getting back to how it can influence our creativity, it's just very basic. The more information we have, the more resources we have, the more contacts we have, the easier it is for us to get creative. So it's at least as, as an, essential, an essential part of how we can develop uh, something interesting, something new. Uh, and the last point is uh, how does it actually then uh, influence the process um, in organizations, for example, and what potential is there? And here very shortly, I want to uh, go to the first project uh, that I, uh, um, I will present also a little bit later, uh, is um, something uh, where artists and scientists, they are both bound to their world, they are both bound to specific rules, but as soon as they start to collaborate, they are somehow um, out of their um, normal routines and thus it creates liminal spaces. And liminal spaces are those spaces that help us to make new connections and try things new because this is where we are allowed to try things that are new. Um, and then uh, I want to uh, point to another project, um, the um, uh, Planet Labs Artists in Residence program where just organizations say, oh wow, employee retention just go go went up and um, we had a lot of positive feedback that we are such an integrative culture or even just uh, engineers, we are in the Silicon Valley and we are a small, small company compared to the big ones. Uh, but um, uh, engineers saying that they would apply or rather apply at our space at, uh, at our small company because we have this open culture where everybody can express also their ideas. And the last project is uh, the victimless letter project I want to show here is um, about um, 
how can you then ask about very innovative outcomes here. So the predecessor of this project was actually the summer living steak, which was the first uh, in vitro meat ever grown, and was by artists. And it was not about saving the world, it was about contextualizing what we have here, asking a lot of questions, social question, cultural question of how we deal with meat, how we deal with animals. And then as actually only later came this discussion, this industrial discussion, um, should we use this also uh, as a solution to a more complex problem? And as I see that I'm running short on time, I will just ex uh, do very shortly some uh, examples of how these collaborations uh, can happen between artists and scientists so that everybody can benefit. And uh, they have very different formats, also depending on the needs and the goals. So the first one is uh, the Pollards project uh, by Poelvizia and the Swiss Polar Institute. They want to foster more this long-term collaboration process. Though, so they are trying to um, ask tandems of artists and scientists to apply for this grant to be able to have a more uh, ongoing uh, exchange process between artists and scientists who are both interested in the same topic. In this case, it's, it's polar issues and polar sciences. The next one uh, was the case of ESA, where uh, through the Ars Electronica Digital Art and Science Network grant, um, Sarah Patkus was able to stay at uh, ASTEC, so the uh, science and technology facilities in Nordwijk, um, to work uh, on her project, uh, that's Noodlefeed, that's her robot, uh, who then, uh, where she got in contact with many different scientists, so she was able uh, to induce a lot of questions and raise new ideas, but also was very motivational to the scientists there. Uh, the next project, um, completely different again, but we heard about uh, uh, yesterday, is the experiment in art and technology, where artists and scientists work together first for a very long term uh, on something that they're both interested in, and uh, only afterwards there's the question, do we want to create an artwork, or is there some, some feedback into, into the scientific process? And this is actually something that comes on top with extra funding and the commission work. Uh, here, this is a, a, an example about artists visiting scientific facilities, similar to certain residencies, where it's uh, a lot about the artistic opportunity to visit these facilities, but also to talk to scientists and engineers. And the artworks coming out of that, like the super supersymmetry by Yoji Ikeda, are very interesting um, and often communicate some scientific aspect, but it's not science communication, but it's also very interesting for the cultural development in these uh, scientific organizations. Uh, this is Autodesk. Um, the residency program there is all about, of course, their industrial products. But um, it's also some very um, wonderful um, melting pool for a lot of artists to meet and to engage and to get access actually to these tools. And then it, in this case, it's actually the first robotic tattooing machine um, with this robot arm. Uh, it was not only about this robot arm and, and this access, it was also about a learning process for the organization, uh, especially here, it, it was about the security, uh, the safety department, because the safety department went crazy uh, having somebody tattooing with a robot arm. Uh, and they learned a lot and they are now really leaders in, in these conferences about how do we approach safety and robots in organizations. And the last project uh, I wanted to mention is that even uh, that there are some artistic and uh, also communication questions that are able to bring together artists and scientists. And um, there the question was, what are future visions of health and technology and how can artists contribute? And this is a beautiful project where the artists uh, worked with the neuroscientists, with, uh, with 
with a hardware technology uh, with hardware specialists, software developers, um, and, and uh, even um, children and, and therapists and their their parents. And actually, it was also successful that it then contributed to the organization that the organization thought, oh wow, we should uh, the one organization uh, that creates the EET uh, sensors, that they thought, oh wow, we should actually open up what we do to a more creative audience, because it is very interesting, also in our specialized field of uh, these EET sensors and uh, neuroscience to open up um, to opportunities to um, designers and artists. And they even created an interface that is, uh, is uh, available for a lower price for the creative audience just to do these experiments. Um, yeah, so just a few examples of how you can create this. Thank you. <laughs> Dear audience, please join us at slide.do, hashtag Relogia01, in order to ask your questions of the speakers. Thank you. On the science chair. Professor Sarantos Sicaris, School of Pedagogical and Technological Education, STEAM Education, Aspete, Greece. So Clark can change the, the slides from here. Okay. Should I open up? Okay. So, hello everybody. I'm very happy to be here. I would like to thank the organizers, and especially Svetana, for inviting me to be here. I will try to delineate the computational part of uh, STEAM. And uh, my proposal is computational STEM pedagogy, which arises from the integration of computational thinking, the computing, the computational science education and the epistemology of engineering in order to come up to computational part of uh, STEAM or STEAM. So I would like to start with the computational thinking, which is uh, a term coined by Wing in 2008. Actually, it was uh, suggested by Papert some years ago. And the reason that I'm talking about computational thinking is that one of the dimensions or practices of computational thinking, it is the abstraction, which actually runs horizontally many disciplines. And despite the fact that, Wings, that Wing is a Microsoft, uh, is the head of Microsoft Research in Computing, she suggested that computing actually runs horizontally all the disciplines, even the psychology, sociology, etc. So we have to, to accept that the first link between uh, STEM and arts comes from uh, the dimension of uh, abstraction. And abstraction is everywhere. It has different layers, as suggested also by Piaget some years ago. And uh, abstraction is a fundamental issue, which is included in computational, not computer science, as we'll uh, focus later on, and is strongly related to logical reasoning. So uh, here you can see uh, an abstraction of a cow, I think, how it comes to different layers of abstraction. The computational part of abstraction is the last one there. And uh, 
I will close this part about computational thinking with the four dimensions. This is a nice picture, the four dimensions or practices, as they are called, of computational thinking, as they suggested uh, by the channel BBC. So you can see that the fundamental dimensions of computational thinking includes decomposition of a problem to simpler ones, pattern recognition, algorithms, and uh, the, say, uh, a kind of connection of engineering design with um, uh, the art. Unfortunately, here, uh, there is a link that it's my fault that it doesn't play. Uh, it's a link that sees that one of the very famous uh, sorting algorithms in computer science is connected to a Hungarian dance. So, unfortunately, I will pass this slide because this link does not play. So, the second part of my uh, effort to integrate art with STEAM is related to the so-called computer computational science, which is quite different from the computer science. And this actually is the reason that you can see these days, even at the, the American Psychological Association, uh, terms like computational psychology or computational sociology or computational architecture. And this is linked to the so-called creative industry, which actually is a place that runs uh, quite successfully from the economical point of view. Here is a picture of the computational science. This picture is taken from the President's Committee of Advisory in the United States. It was created by President Obama, which shows explicitly that computational science is a kind of, uh, let's say, an umbrella for many uh, other disciplines or cognitive areas like computational, like psychology, sociology, etc. But at that time, art was not included there. By the way, E3 STEM is a professional body established by me and my colleagues in Greece and uh, runs quite successfully. It's an independent body and we try to make uh, some efforts to include art in education. So, the fourth part is related to engineering. Engineering actually is a discipline which is composed by engineering content like physics, mathematics, etc. And the second and more important for the connection with uh, arts is the engineering design. So, one of the major questions raised is how does engineering education interact with science, technology, arts, and mathematics? And this is a fundamental um, question, which is raised also by the national generation of science standards in the United States. So, engineering design, the second component of engineering, has been also treated as a pedagogical, as a pedagogy of solving ill-defined, in other words, open-ended problems by developing creative thinking, formulating solutions, and making decisions, and considering alternative solutions. And this is considered as a frame how to uh, integrate engineering with arts. This is a justification about this linkage. What is important now is we want to connect engineering or the STEM disciplines with arts. To do so, we have to take into account that in education, we have to change the curriculum. But to change the curriculum and make this, uh, implement this integration, we have to think about the so-called cross-cutting concepts. Cross-cutting concepts are the concepts that they should be included in every curriculum for STEAM. And these are patterns, cause and effect, scale, proportions, and quantify, systems and system models, energy and matters, structure and function, stability and change. So if we want to connect from an epistemological point of view, 
the STEM disciplines with art, we should take into account that we should change the curriculum in order to include, in a concise way, these seven cross-cutting, cross-cutting is the name in the United States, in Europe they are called big ideas in the curriculum. So, we have to speak about epistemology. Epistemology is a branch of philosophy which uh, discusses the justification of knowledge, the, the, the way we learn, etc. So, uh, we have heard these two days many things about the interdisciplinary approach or I would like to, to coin the term transdisciplinary approach, which is something which for me is more close to STEAM, even uh, that I'm using interdisciplinary approach. Interdisciplinary approach analyzes, synthesizes, and harmonizes links between disciplines into a coordinate and coherent whole. I would like to say that despite the fact that I'm considered as a STEM guy, I cannot say that I have an exact, uh, complete, compact, concise definition of STEM. Anyway, as a primary approach, I would say that STEM is an holistic interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary approach based on computational science, taking into the fact that the whole is bigger than its parts, as Aristotle said some years ago, thousand years ago, or according to Gelstadt, um, part in uh, psychology. Here you can see the differences between the disciplinary approach, the multidisciplinary approach, the interdisciplinary approach, and the transdisciplinary approach. I would like to stress that during the interdisciplinary approach, we have something like two things to interact, producing sometimes a new discipline. And the new discipline, in my opinion, at this case, is a discipline that have interacting methodologies between arts, science, and uh, technology. Uh, there are two approaches for STEM education, the content integration and the context, the context integration. And I am the support of content integration where we have one of these big ideas and we try to face a real life problem, taking into account the different disciplines in an holistic way. So, let's move now to STEAM. I have five minutes, okay. Studies have also suggested that learning through the arts has the ability to transcend across different disciplines. Similarly, when arts coursework was integrated in a university engineering program, this is another study, students were able to capitalize on the inquiry-based teaching and learning approach. So, we can see that there is a dual relationship between arts and engineering, and one feeds the other. So, um, some other researchers focus on the fact that the STEM to STEM movement presents new language. We need every science has methodology, epistemology, and language. So, we need a new language in order to go for this integration in an effective way. Here is a nice picture about the, different, the interaction of different met methodologies between the disciplines um, of STEM. You cannot see art because art was not considered at that time as a part of this interaction of methodologies. So the big question is where we have to include art in this picture? Uh, why interdisciplinary approach in STEAM? In transdisciplinary approach or in interdisciplinary approach, there are chances for generating new knowledge. So we need new knowledge for this new field. And according to some researchers, very specialist in epistemology, transdisciplinarity is concerned with creating new integrated knowledge to address the complex problems of the world. You see that we know now that the new science that's coming now is the complex, the complex theory. So, we have another thing that we, we need interaction between methodologies, not, let's say, to, to look at each other now, but interaction of methodologies. And the interaction of methodologies comes at the point that the different disciplines meet each other at the nodes or 
at the space between the disciplines. So uh, from the epistemological point of view, we need to think about interaction of methodologies, even at the nodes when these subjects are interconnected, or at the spaces between these subjects. Uh, there is a very nice work by Campbell et Sambel, Sam, Samsel, which states that uh, art, science, and technology can collaborate, but the spectrum of this collaboration is threefold. And they explain in this very nice picture how this uh, threefold interaction comes. The first thing is to consider is the intent of the work. Is the work being presented as a work of art, a work of science, or a combination? The second one is regards the breadth of the subject matter. And just as scientific research can be brought in scope, exploring wide reaching areas of understanding, so often is art. Also, like science, art may instead be focused on a specific area of scientific research. So we have to clarify uh, the, the focus of arts uh, against the focus of science. And as a third example of a continuum on which work can be considered the physical virtual continuum addresses the physical properties of the work. For example, is it a sculpture that has mass it sits on the pedestal from the physical point of view, or it is an idea with abstraction layers? So uh, now I'm, going, I'm moving to some examples of this connection. Some people from artists, they consider that the part of the computer science related exactly to arts is the artificial intelligence. It's one artist said, for example, that artistic behavior is intelligent behavior. There are some other work by, for example, Ira Greenberg, aesthetics at computations, and he declares that um, coding, coding is an initiative taken in the United States and in Europe about how children can be involved in coding, is a kind of artwork. Like in this example, for example. Um, I will try to accelerate because I have passed the time already. So I'm going to show you some examples of uh, my team. The first one is about the mystery triangles in a museum in um, Britain, the Contemporary Museum of, uh, of Arts. They wanted to celebrate the number 10. So they created these mystery triangles when you can see that if you know the color of these boxes at the ends, you can find the color at the top of this triangle. Uh, this is a very important theorem in mathematics called the balak ram theorem, created in 1908 by some Indian mathematicians. And uh, this actually is an exhibition in the Contemporary Art Museum in the UK. So me and my colleagues have created this code in Scratch and in Python for education. Here you can see the famous Voronoi diagrams. Uh, you can take, for example, the vertical in the middle of a, a, a section, and you can find some points, like, for example, K1 or K2 here, and you can split the spatial two-dimensional space in different regions. And then you have this very nice picture of Voronoi diagrams. Uh, this picture is from the Lidra Marriott Hotel in Frankfurt in Germany. So what is the relation of that with the information technology? For example, we have created a project where at points, for example, if you are a fireman and you have a fire in a forest, you have some sensors here, and depending on um, where is the uh, water tankers, you can be guided by sensors according to the geometry of the Voronoi diagrams in order to, to go to the nearest place. So here in this example, you can connect uh, physical computing with sensors, uh, mathematics, and arts. 
Uh, finally, uh, possibly you know the director of Zorbas, the Greek, or Stella. It was Michael Kakoyanis, and he has established a foundation in Greece where Kostas Kalovrektis and me were invited to create um, a seminar for students running for six months now, where here you can see that we have a small robot. We, inside, the cost of all of that is about five euros, and inside the robot you, we have an Arduino, which is a, a platform, it's a controller, a microcontroller, and here you can see a small person, a small guy. We have two things like that, put in the eyeballs, and according to the sentiments, uh, it is crying, it is laughing, etc., according to the directions provided by the Arduino. This is a classical example of physical computing and um, arts, and emotional intelligence, actually. Uh, there are also some projects which connect uh, educational robotics with art, like this one, suggested by Fred Martin and others some years ago. Uh, there are some other examples that uh, emphasize the relations of algorithms from the computer science and dance. Here is the link, you can find this from the uh, slides. And uh, I would like to give you another example that I'm, we are working now. You know how to, for example, when you have different packets with data uh, in a network, then these packets are arranged in order, in the correct order, at the right hand side. So this is a classical computational algorithm, and the same, the same algorithm applies to the classification of notes in music. So uh, we are trying now to create a program in Python and in Scratch in order to teach this algorithm uh, in music. Uh, the National Academy of Sciences in uh, Washington has created another project which uh, is called uh, Algorithm Has Art In. And you can visit this very nice link and you can see how the algorithms, in other words, the computational part, is connected to art. And I close because I'm afraid of this girl there. Uh, with some elements of history uh, stolen by Doherty in this very nice paper in 2013 that he includes in his paper that modern cell phones use a form of encryption called frequency hoping to, uh, to uh, secure your messages, uh, etc. Frequency hoping was invented by the composer George Athelin, and in collaboration with the actress Hody Lamar. I didn't know that until yesterday. And computer chips are made using a combination of three classical artistic inventions, etching, screen printing, and photolithography. So, uh, in Greece, we have established a week ago a new journal called Hellenic STEM education. You are invited to visit this journal and write and uh, send your papers. And I would like to thank you again for your attention and I'm at your disposal for any questions you may raise to me. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Dear audience, please join us at slide.do. Uh, hashtag Relogia01, where you can ask your questions of the speakers. Thank you. On the tech chair, Aravind Panch, Dream Space Academy, Sri Lanka. I think we all are on the edge of our cognitive load and uh, 
I think no one has any more interest <laughs> to listen to anyone's talk, so I'll just quickly finish it. It's not my slide. And, uh, yes. Um, yeah, I'm not here to tell about uh, what is STEM, STEAM, or whatever other, other terminologies used here. Can I see my slide? Yeah. Should I press? No? So, I think I can start. Um, there's so much light. Um, so, Dream Space Academy, I'm going to present about Dream Space Academy. Dream Space Academy is a community innovation center based in Sri Lanka uh, to tackle uh, socioeconomic and environmental challenges using uh, project based and challenge based learning. So, nothing more than that. We are a very simple social enterprise which I co founded along with several social enterprises that I have co-founded in, in Asia and Europe and, and Africa. So, um, okay, so I changed the slide and they used some other slide which was before, anyway. So, um, so what we do basically, we create, we create uh, solutions like for local problems using uh, open source innovation. So, we don't reinvent, we take some open source innovation and then there are a group of people, they we create it as a product, and then we lead them into 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 to startups or social uh, enterprise. So, what is the motivation? Is the Sri Lanka is as an island, which was very chaotic. Um, my timer is also not running. Yeah, and uh, we had 30 years of war, and we had like all these natural disasters, and so people were getting a lot of free stuffs. So because of that, from a lot of international aid fund, uh, organization, and so you can see they are really low on the edge of uh, being innovative country in Asia. And uh, when um, all these international aid uh, organization, they come with a uh, lot of their own solutions and for the problems, but however, these solutions are not really solving their local problem because they don't involve a lot of the local people. So we thought that we want to involve like 99% of the local resources to support, uh, to create a solution with the support of all those uh, 1,200, more than 1,200 uh, international NGOs in, in, in Sri Lanka. Um, so how do we do that? Um, so we created Dream Space Academy with four verticals. So one of that is a project-based learning where we are training kids and adults uh, with uh, several um, interdisciplinary subjects, uh, or like with projects. And then we identify the good ones, maybe like six to seven among 100 students, and we move them to community innovation where there are a group of people developing solutions, and it's a paid job, kind of a paid research and development job by the community. And um, I'm talking about real um, uh, solutions because the problem of all these STEM, STEAM robotics courses, like you know, serving their lights, it's not really solving the problem of, 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 of several uh, communities in the world. And uh, so we don't want to go in that track. We want to have like immediate uh, solutions for our problems. So we want to invent ourselves because all the imported solutions were not really uh, you know useful for us. I can give a small example, like one of the international aid organization. Um, came with the solution for one of our borderline village, so village which is at the border of the, the jungle, which is very much affected by elephants, wild elephants killing people there. So in a year, around 80 people, 85 people die there by wild elephants. And during the war time, we didn't have electricity there, and uh, so the international aid organization sitting here in Europe decided, okay, we can solve your problem. Okay, how? So they decided to build a, a electric uh, fence using solar panel and as Ari was saying it was a linear uh, one of our speaker was saying like you know problem was elephant and we need to have a solution so on like so they used those reflective solar panel and they put it in the jungle and they said oh we solved the problem and after a few months it doesn't work because jungle does not have only elephants right so there are monkeys so when you show a mirror to a monkey it's actually offending the monkey so they broke all the solar panels so this is how all the international taxpayer money from <laughs> all of your money, all of our money is wasted. So we want to use that money, but we want to use it wisely. That's how we created the community innovation model. 
So you would have heard about the STEM, STEAM, robotics, fab labs, and makerspaces, which are thousands of these centers are shut down all around the world because it's kind of a fun thing to do. It's not really doing solving some problem. Okay, you, go, you send your kids to a STEM course, and what do they do after that? You know, they just come home or maybe 3D print something and put it on a table. There's no impact that can be measured immediately. So we don't want to be that way, and because we have a lot of local problems, and we don't want to import solution, and that's, that's what we do. So interna uh, for that, we also need a lot of international expertise. So there are a lot of scientists from Europe going there, uh, staying there for three to four weeks, and then develop a curriculum around the project that they, they, they work on. So something like we were building a water quality measurement tool, and then and, uh, people from, from, from Europe, uh, scientists like biochemists, goes there and develop a curriculum around water quality measurement not just biochemistry as a subject. So that's what this international collaboration means. And then finally, we spin off these prototypes into products and test with the local government and scale it across the island. And, um, and that, that means that the, the product, the prototype becomes a product which can be locally produced. And uh, that's what this social enterprise vertical uh, does. So I, I will not go detail uh, about all these things. So for example, about the project-based learning, and we have, as I said, like from kids to like 50, 40 years old people, and um, we focus on these uh, labs, yeah, kind of uh, different labs, so electronics, mechanics. Electronics comes with all the electronics and programming and whatever. Mechanics comes with mechanical design and digital fabrication. Wet lab is, uh, as you know, bio and biochemistry and chemistry stuffs, and we have like kind of a bioreactor growing algaes and stuff like that. Gastronomy is about uh, alternative food, like we have one project, uh, like creating uh, probiotic drinks from hibiscus than using yogurt or something. Textile is, again, another lab which focuses on alternative uh, textile, like generating, taking silk out of silkworm without killing the worm. And material is, again, different types of material, something like polyelectrolyte, which is a polymer, conductive degradable electronics, and so on. So we, we have several programs in these main labs, and also we have other labs like art and languages and music and so on. And uh, you can see some photos of uh, our community building stuffs. Um, so one, that photo is uh, urban farming, and uh, the one below is, yeah, we had a tsunami in 2004, and then uh, the, the backwater and ocean salinity changed, and there's like hundreds of thousands or maybe millions of eels migration change and people think it's a snake. They don't know why it's moving, it's coming out. And uh, so we need an underwater glider to uh, really understand what's happening in the ocean. So underwater glider from a Norwegian company costs 200,000 euros. We will be never able to buy that. So this is an open source project, completely a functional open source project, which costs 1,000 euros. So we can take all those open source innovation and build this thing on our own so we know how to repair iTrade and maintain it. And the other one is the circular plastic. It's again from the precious plastic project that we have an installation where people pick up plastic bottles, put it there, shred it, make it a filament. And then there's an injection molding machine where you can make some small uh, stuffs like a comb or a clip and so on. So these are the innovations. So we mainly focus on environmental sustainability and then we have real research and development. It's not those fun making, it's about critical making and, uh, um, and uh, we take everything from open source uh, innovations, like you know, there are open source MRI machines, there are open source uh, insulin, open insulin. So these are the things that we would love to work on, so that we can have those solutions cheap for us. And then ultimately, providing a platform for local manufacturing and small micro factories, so that we can also give jobs and skill to people uh, who are not part of DreamSpace. So some photos about some programs about international collaboration. We are also working with several international organizations. We have been selected by uh, Duke of Edinburgh and Stockholm uh, Water Prize as the regional uh, national coordinator in Sri Lanka to choose those uh, candidates and send it to UK and Sweden. Uh, social enterprise is one of uh, one of a core. So this is a center where we are running uh, a lot of, it's at the beach, 20 meters from the beach, like a co-working space. Uh, Cafe, digital nomad, and you know cultural events. Our social entrepreneurship is based on community business. It's not that one person owns that. And then uh, we always believe in the socio-economic development because in Sri Lanka, a country like in Sri Lanka, you cannot talk about science in the first place. You have to talk about socio-economic development, and then how we can use these these four four uh, concepts to to create jobs and skills and 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 not in 20 years, but now. So this is what we, what we do at DreamSpace. 
you can see that we provide pro we have several centers one in this is in jungle and then then one is in a, in a city and uh, in a, in another one at the beach uh this is where we uh, do a lot of um, art work and micro arts and different types of art things and uh this is at the this is the borderline village that we have adopted uh, there are 104 kids uh they don't even have water to drink. The problem is is different, completely different. They are they have been attacked by wild elephants, and they don't have even bore well or tap to have water. But still, when we asked one of the kid like what what is the ideal world for this person, he mentioned he still was drawing a world with the elephant there. So they really want to coexist and co-create the dreams, and this is what we want to give to them. We don't want to go and tell them there is another model of design thinking, another model of STEM team, but create values for them for their lives, day-to-day -day life. And it's not science or the science engagement team or robotics is not the, the thing that we have to solve in first place. We have to solve a lot of social, like psychological, ethnical, political issues. For example, like there was a blast in Sri Lanka in 2000, this, this April, and, and, and then affected a lot of our work and all these international experts cancel all their trip and then whatever the community innovation we were doing was like uh, stopped by the government thinking that we are also doing something wrong so these are the struggle that um, um, that we face and um, uh, we also won the, the falling wall science engagement uh, in this year uh, in Berlin uh, there were like 44 countries competing for the for the science engagement and um, I mean there was another slide anyway so um, so this is all about Dream Space Academy, and uh, we are building the change what we want to see in the world. And then in a country like Sri Lanka or underdeveloped, underdeveloping country, the science engagement, the science, whatever that, that terms that we use here, comes at the last. There are so many other soci social problems and engagement, socioeconomic problems that we have to solve in first place. So thank you, everyone, for listening. And, uh, Uh, yeah. Dear audience, um, now we can begin with the uh, trilogue. Please join us at slide.do slash hashtag Relogia01 for your questions. Team four, co-creative environment. Artside Tech, Trilog 8. Thanks for joining us. And uh, the first question, um, let's start with uh, Dr. Schnog. Um, Shouldn't funding agencies be bringing the synergization between science and arts to the mainstream via focused grants? Uh, is this a uh, question direct? Um, I'm, I'm, I think the question is directed towards outreach or... Uh, I'm not sure if I understand the question correctly. <laughs> Um, honestly, um, perhaps just the, the, the uh, since you mentioned uh, some examples of arts and science, so there, there is um, perhaps funding grants to incorporate art in the work of scientists. Uh, there is, um, there are a few things happening right now. So there is the Starts Grant by the EU. Uh, by, uh, as part of the Horizon 2020 program that was the first attempt to um, create opportunities for artists uh, in ICT projects. Um, the approaches there are very, um, uh, yeah, they're, they're at the beginning actually. It's I think the third or fourth year uh, they're doing this and they're right now still learning about what it's actually good for and why are, are we doing this. Um, often artists are only in part of scientific projects or programs uh, via the outreach fund, and which is very, very 
uh, a low-level uh, engagement opportunity because it's, it's not that much funding the process, it's more funding a few outreach activities. Uh, so I think it's still very much at the beginning, and of course there should be much more funding in this direction, but I think it's also um, important to understand what the process actually does and how the process can be integrated uh, between artists and scientists so that the funding can be directed uh, much more specifically and also that it can become more mainstream. Any other opinions? Yes, please. Yes, I would like to stress the point that uh, last year the European Commission actually advertised some programs in uh, Erasmus KA2 and KA3, uh, focusing on the how to integrate STEM in education. Even at my country, there is a call that's running until uh, December uh, about how to incorporate uh, STEM in education as an innovation practice. Thank you very much. Uh, and the, the second question, I think you partly answered, uh, but maybe you can begin again. Uh, what are the efficient methods to transfer these uh, STEAM practices into schools Europe-wide? Should I start? Yes, yes, please. Okay. I think that th we are at the cutting edge of the complexity in uh, science, economy, and in education too. So this is a question that uh, should be taken uh, seriously by the politicians. It's, uh, it's an easy answer if they take into account that they, we should go for the so-called um, new curriculum and justice, a social justice in education in order to um, leave this gap between poor and rich students, um, not to increase that, but to reduce that. So, for my opinion, STEAM practices can be implemented if we change the curriculum and decide how to, let's say, include uh, in the curriculum the, these big ideas referred by me before uh, across the curriculum and uh, find a correct epistemological, um, say, uh, definition of STEAM in education. This is very simple, but I'm not sure that it's also simple for the politicians and how teachers will react towards that because teachers feel insecure about the inclusion of STEAM in education because they are afraid that um, their uh, subject of teaching is going to be more loose connected, is going to be loose connected to the curriculum. For my opinion, this is not true. To, uh, for a real STEAM curriculum, we have to have more experience and teachers, they should know their subject knowledge and they should, and this is more important, to uh, learn how to interact in order to solve a real problem from life. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other opinions on this question? Yeah. All right, and uh, the last question that we have here is uh, addressed at uh, Mr. Punch. Uh, do you think your model is exportable uh, or applicable to developing countries um, to, for applied learning and sustainable development? I don't know where the person is sitting and asking this question. <laughs> yeah, anyway. So um, I think, yes, um, we are already uh, working with several countries, governments, uh, organization in Global South. Um, um, so after this, in a week, I'm going to, I'll be in Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda, and Tanzania, where we are talking about uh, critical making. And, uh, and also we have been uh, established some projects in Indonesia. So I think this 
will be working perfectly well in underdeveloped and uh, developing countries. But uh, after the falling walls, also the like Eastern European countries, like one of the largest organization in Romania, they, they train thousands of uh, students in uh, in uh, in STEM and robotics, and they came and they they really cannot measure an impact. What is what is after STEM? What is after robotics course? And and they are really want to have something which is tangible and solves immediate immediate problem. So I think this can also work in in uh, in uh, in, uh, in in so to say uh, other nations in Europe, and all our model and all our. Um, um, Framework. The documentation is done using open source, uh, open um, like open knowledge foundation or like co-governance model, which is openly available, so anyone can take it and uh, and uh, reproduce it uh, locally. And we can maybe like give uh, uh, some tra support on that. I mean, even the founder of Fab Academy, Professor Neil Gershenfeld, the founder of Fab Labs, has uh, has witnessed that thousands of Fab Labs and STEM workshops have been shut down all around the world, and what is the next moment? The next moment is critical making, which is like make something that makes sense, not just for fun. So I think this is needed in, in many other places. Okay, thank you very much, and let's our, uh, thank our speakers again. Mm -hmm. Performance, nine. Gravity, synth. Leon, Trembo. Fellow at Steam House, Birmingham. Founder, Gravity Synth, UK. Hello. I'm Leon. And uh, I was going to give you a performance today, but... The equipment got delayed on the flight, and I think it might be here in about half an hour. So uh, there may be a chance tomorrow if there's a club uh, kind of opportunity, but tonight it's not going to happen. So I'm going to play you a uh, recording from our performance on the World Service, which happened earlier this year. But before that, I'm just going to tell you a little story of how I became a uh, science enabler and I as an audiovisual performer um, from Birmingham in the UK uh, was part of a studio called Birmingham Open Media and I sat next to one of the Gravitational Wave Institute researchers um, Hannah Middleton who's now in Melbourne Australia doing uh, postdoctoral research in gravitational waves for LIGO, and I won't go into any of the details of the hardware because that's all in the interview. But she sat next to me and told me that gravitational waves make chirp sounds when, when black holes collide. So I, I was immediately uh, interested in, in how we could uh, create some kind of performance out of this. Um, and I sort of started hanging around in the labs uh, for gravitational waves at Birmingham University. And um, one thing led to another. I started working with uh, Aaron Jones, who's in the interview as well. He's the, um, I become quite a good friend, and I found out a year into working with him that he lives on the same road as me in Birmingham as well, so it was cool. Um, and we developed the sort of hardware uh, and started performing live. We performed at uh, Newton's house uh, in uh, Walsthorpe Manor in Grantham in the north of the UK and um, at Music Tech Fest from inside uh, a nuclear reactor. I've bounced the sounds of the gravity synth off the moon and Martin Nicole was talking about this earlier on after meeting her and we're still good friends. So um, it's got around quite a lot and uh, I think I'll leave it there and let the uh, let the interview play. We all have one thing in common. We are made of stuff.
Paul Ferguson, who's up there in Edinburgh, and Matt here in the uh, studio in the Radio Theatre in London. And uh, we're going to stay on a kind of uh, musical theme now. And in fact, we're going from a lag of just a few thousandth of a second to a few billion years. Because right at the other extreme, we have musicians who have made a synthesizer that's based on these detectors that pick up some of the most violent and distant events in space, things like black holes colliding. I think Aaron Jones needs to unpack some of this for us, PhD student at the, Institutional, at the Institute for Gravitational Wave Astronomy at the University of Birmingham in England. And there's a bit of a clue, gravitational wave astronomy. So briefly, if you can, what's a gravitational wave, Aaron? So a gravitational wave is a ripple in what scientists call space-time. Okay, well, that was certainly brief. That's good to know. Yeah. No, genuinely, I wanted a brief answer because then I wanted to get into the, this whole big deal that you'd think that if you've got a ripple in space time, that sounds like a very big event, and yet they're very difficult to detect, aren't they? They're extraordinarily difficult to detect. So our detectors um, are typically four kilometers long, and we're looking for a signal that's smaller than the diameter of a proton. Wow. And how is that done using detectors here on Earth? So we use laser light and we split it into two different directions. And what we do is we time how long it t uh, takes the laser to get out to some end mirrors that are four kilometers away and are reflected back to what we call a beam splitter. And then these waves interfere with each other. And when the gravitational wave passes through the Earth, we get a signal out, a light signal, that we can then read out and measure electronically. Right, OK. So some, something like maybe two black holes, big heavy things collide. Let's just say three billion years ago, they send this gravitational wave coursing through the universe. It makes the Earth wobble. Nobody feels it, but if you happen to have a four kilometer long laser, it might just pick that up. Is that kind of... Just about. So okay. we need to use a lot of tricks yeah. to, get, uh, to amplify this signal. So we start with a really big laser because that helps. More light means more signal. And then we resonate this light in some optical cavities across four kilometers. And we actually find we're limited by fundamental limitations in quantum mechanics. OK, right. Well, we're, and we're going to find out how we're going to make our own gravitational waves, kind of, in the theatre with audiovisual artist Leon Trimble. And you're working with Aaron. And I, I wonder if, 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 Leon, we can just get you straight over to the synthesizer just sure. to save time. So we're going to get you to dash across the stage. So this is Leon, who is heading to this wondrous pile of kit. Anybody who loves analog synthesizers, and I do, is just going to get so excited. This device that has all these patch cables linking everything together. Um, but you have a laser set up on the stage as well. So basically what happens is that, Leon, you're able to trigger something that, I suppose, disrupts the laser in a similar way to how a gravitational wave might do when it comes and arrives here. Is that That's it? That's right, yes. I can hit it if we've got some sound. Right, so we're hitting the laser and hoping there's some sound. And uh, there we are. It's not the sound of the Big Bang, it's the sound of a few little bangs there so, from Leon's... So we have a very local interferometer here. These aren't four kilometres long, they're more like four centimetres. But we still split a laser beam, and the laser beam hits two mirrors. One of the mirrors I send vibrations to, and when they recombine, they should cancel each other out, but when one of the mirrors is vibrated, they have destructive interference and you get a signal. Right. Well, I think we should hear some of your music. So, you know, gravitational waves come to Earth, they interact with these massive four kilometer long lasers. That's one thing. So, Leon is simulating that very motion as he starts his performance here and he's disrupting his lasers. So, he's actually using his musical kit to kind of be a bit like a gravitational wave that then comes back into his synthesizers to make some music as we're about to hear.
round of applause. <laughs>